So, so let's start this lovely conversation. So this conversation is part of the Love in Action Women series. It's a series to showcase and tell stories of resilience and also where we dive into the depth of who we are as, as women, of the incredible divine archetypes that we embody and to really start to pave the way of inspiration for all of the women out there with um, the mental space that we co-create here in this conversation. Um, we're looking for tools of mental health, mental hygiene, mental resilience um, for our mental well-being to support ultimately a global transformation um, in our own way, at our own pace. So um, Deepak, would you mind starting with a very short and, 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 and beautifully um, timed dive into the divine feminine and the archetypes? And maybe that could be in the form of another meditation. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you. Great to meet you, Mara, again. And uh, Gabriela, just as a brief introduction, archetypes in Jungian psychology represent the unconscious mind, personal, collective, uh, archetypal, and universal. So every thought that we have is actually influenced by the collective mind and the archetypal mind and the universal mind. And um, think of goddesses or the divine feminine as symbolic representations of empowerment. Simple way to understand. And uh, they're universal. Uh, I'm going to use Western names right now because people are more familiar, but you'll find the archetypes in Egypt, in India, in the American Indian traditions, in every culture, and they're universal. So please close your eyes, uncross your legs, Put your feet firmly on the ground, keep your hands open, and let's start with very simple breath awareness right now. And breath is a way to quieten our mind. And as I mentioned the archetypes, create whatever image you want in your mind for that particular archetype. There's no fixed image, although I may give you some hints, okay? The divine feminine, the first archetype, is Demeter in Greek. She represents mother, affection, tenderness, nurturing. Evoke any image that represents to you the divine mother. Could be your own mother, could be yourself. The second archetype is Hera. She represents power, self-power, not agency power, but power that comes from the depths of being. Self-power is immune to criticism, feels beneath no one, is fearless. Hera, the archetypal divine power. Third archetype, Athena. She represents wisdom, knowledge, art, culture, music, science, discovery. Moving on, Athena. I think I mentioned Athena. So moving on, Aphrodite. Beauty, sensuality, sexuality. Aphrodite. She rules the worlds of entertainment and influences culture in a very big way. Aphrodite. Moving on, Artemis. She connects with nature. She connects with animals, with plants. She 
She is our hope for reversing climate change. Artemis. Artemis is Greek, equivalent in Rome is Diana. Moving on, Persephone. She navigates the unconscious mind. She's a healer, she's an alchemist, she's a transformer. We desperately need her right now to heal our collective insanity. Persephone. And finally, Hestia, the homemaker, the homemaker of the family, the homemaker of society, and ultimately the homemaker of the planet, our collective home. So once again, Demeter, Mother, Hera, Power, Athena, Wisdom, Aphrodite, Sensuality, Beauty, Sexuality, Artemis, Nature, Persephone, Healer, Hestia, Homemaker. As we move forward into the next era, we all need to embody the divine feminine, irrespective of who we are, male, female, transgender, non-binary, doesn't matter. The divine feminine needs to transform and heal the world so we can have a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. So now as you relate to any of these archetypes in your mind, let them go, release them and uh, just observe your breath. And then just start going deeper into your own awareness. And we'll use a simple mantra to do that. The mantra is, I am. So let go of all names, all forms, all images. Just repeat the words, I am, with no form and no name attached to them. If you want, you can replace I am with aham, the sound, the vibration, aham. Finally, release the mantra and rest in the presence of your own being. Rest in awareness. Awareness is who we are. There's no shape, no form, no name. Doesn't exist in time. But it's our being. So rest in being. The highest intelligence. And let the archetypes find a place in you. Incarnate them, embody them. and all power and glory to the divine feminine in all of us. Rest in being. If you want, you can feel your body and relax and open your eyes. Thank you, Deepak.
Thank you so much. How do you feel, Mara? <laughs> so we have to start every Zoom call. Like this, right? I think we should start every conversation, you know, with, with th th this. Not only is it a meditation, but it's an activation of, of our truest potential, of our truest selves, of our, you know, we call it highest selves. But I also like to use the words truest selves, meaning it reflects the truth in our modus operandi, you know, as a woman. And, and leading into that, actually, what was there an archetype that, that, that you felt that you maybe embodied more than the other, but also I, I look at life stories. We've just experienced probably one of the most historical times of our new century, um, which is a pandemic and, and everyone has been affected by it in different shapes and forms whether it's physically, whether it's grief, whether it's loss, whether it's mentally, emotionally, spiritually also, you know, we, the, it has an effect in all of these realms. So was there an archetype or is there an archetype, maybe one of the ones that we just mentioned, um, that, that helped you maybe during this time? Was there, did you create a relationship with a new version of yourself to, to experience what we've just experienced? I feel um, so many parts of many of the archetypes and how I've worked through this year and where I've <laughs> drawn strength and comfort and inspiration from. Um, from this group, I feel most at this point closely related to um, Persephone in, in the pursuit of collecting from the consciousness and bringing it forth in what way I can do that. And then Aphrodite comes through because I speak and work through beauty. And I embrace the um, connectedness to sensuality and sexuality through that creative force and what that turns into. Um, and at the same time, I also, definitely hold Demeter and the relationship right now to nature and how in, it's the medicine. And so it's, I feel from those three, I and mean, there's aspects of all of them, aspects of the mother, aspects of the home, aspects of Hera and that like outward external power. But those three resonate the closest for me during this time and sort of where I thread it together. No, that, that's interesting. So were, were there any, I, I always like bringing, um, I would say practicality into to, to who we are because as women, I feel that <clears throat> we really have to be practical. <laughs> There's, you know, if we're not practical, the family is not, you know, afloat or the company is not afloat if we're leading it. And in every position, even in, if we're not a CEO or we're not the creator or not the co-founder, every position in, in a company has its own place of leadership. And, and, and as a woman, I feel we dig into Demeter or, or we dig into Hestia, the homemaker, even in those places of leadership. So I, I was wondering during these times, was there a very hard moment for you um, in, in, in just, this time as, 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 a, as all of your archetypes, as, as the creator, as Persephone, as, as the homemaker, was there a hard time where you needed to, to, to create tools that you hadn't used before? Absolutely. I, I can't imagine anyone who didn't experience um, their own version of contraction and loss and grief through this year. And I've actually, who I call on quite a bit and have thought so much about this year really is around Kali energy. And so understanding her purpose and that even this year has come with such intense purpose for us, um, as opposed to just being this wild destruction that threw things up, it, it, it cleared the soil. It, it invited us for new seeds. It invited us to... Um, actually understand our soil 
And so for me this year, being in a position of um, running this business, it was my 20th year. So it marked 20 years wow. in May. And of course, uh, in 20 years, you go through cycles of contraction and expansion, and you go through um, painful points of insecurity and not understanding your own power as a leader or really needing to call on help. And this year was probably the greatest challenge around that. It was just so quick in which things happened. There was no time to sort of, um, in the beginning get grounding, like the contraction came on so quickly and I saw a company cut into half in, in a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. And I saw, you know, had to make incredibly painful decisions around making the company much smaller, reducing um, employees and moving out of a space and having to go with that and make decisions that were in a time that I had nothing to ground it on. Like I couldn't look to the playbook and say, okay, okay, when this has happened or call this person and say, okay, when this happened to you, how did you handle it? Because we were all, and part of the beauty of it is that we were all experiencing the newness of this. I mean, I think that there's something so ancient about it, but in our, you know, this lifetime, this experience, there was, it was so new. And it was um, trying to make decisions to care for my collective and care for my family and care for myself and my mental well-being so that I could in turn care for the people around me and, and make decisions that I really didn't fully know how they would turn out. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it was in, incredibly hard. There were so many, I think we get so uncomfortable in that unknown space. It's yeah. just part of our like, oh, I gotta know everything. I gotta feel like I've got it all written down. And, but I, at the same time, I'm incredibly in awe. I'm in New York City. <laughs> in case you missed her, there she is for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm in, I'm in awe. I'm in complete um, reverence and devotion to this past year, big time. It changed my life. It changed the life of everyone around me. And I would have never um, gotten off of the wheel that I had been on. And I feel that um, sometimes discomfort is the greatest catalyst for change in your life. And when you're comfortable, I had a beautiful discomfort before that, like a level of ease. And sometimes that ease like tricks you into staying or not growing. And so that discomfort came in and it just tore everything. And in that place, I had the opportunity to actually change. And I don't know if I would have sought that out on my own ever. Wow. And, and I don't want to get personal here, but I almost do because because you <laughs> you mentioned, you know, your own mental well-being and you mentioned you know, you wouldn't have been able to make this change. So what does that change look like? And what has that transformation, in, what does it, what, what is it? What can, if you can share with us, because it, it's fascinating. Absolutely. I think that there are so many like logistical aspects of change that happened within the business. We've been, our focus has been on sustainability for the past, you know, we shifted the company after 15 years and redirected it and have spent, you know, all of our energy in that space, but there were still things we were unable to get to because of, you know, the rhythm that we were on. And so we sort of had to put things off. It would be great to be able to change the calendar, work at a different pace, take responsibility for our existing liability as opposed to continually creating more. How do we um, take even more ownership of our actions as a company? So that was one that I got to speed the process up a lot. I'm like, okay, I'm not able to create another collection right now wow, I get to do something that I've been wanting to do, but I wouldn't, wouldn't have done it before um, because of the forward momentum. So that was, there was a lot of things in that side of it. And then more in the balance aspect of, I've, I've been a worker bee since the moment I, I was working before I was ever working. I've just been, had that personality where I could just keep going and mm, incredible focus. And I've, I've been a human doing my whole life. And suddenly 
I got to experience more of being what you're talking about. Of this is the great call to slow down. It was like they put on the brakes so fast, we all flew through the windshields. But it was the calling to sit in a whole different space. And I've meditated for years. I call on that for such a, a huge tour in my life and have cultivated stillness and quiet. But <laughs> her song. Um, but when it came to this work balance, work has always been like this driving force. And so a huge change out of this has been about balance. And it's really coming about as we begin to look forward to this somehow this return or this ability to be, you know, in coming back to something and redesigning what we are coming back to as mm -hmm. opposed to coming back to what we had built before because that's done. And mm -hmm. so now as a business, I look at my business as like, uh, I have one man in my business and the rest, it's all women. So we're all living our experience through this and what it means then to actually be a progressive, modern company that holds women first. And yeah. how do we design our time, our awareness, our physical presence? And does it all have to be in this space? Do we all have to show up to an office anymore? Can we redesign what it means to work? to be yeah. leaders, to run a business. And what an opportunity. And talk about leading as women. Yes. We yeah. gave women, you know, the creative art direction to design success. The new, what is success now? Is it built on this patriarchal idea of we work till we die, we get up or there at work, mm -hmm. we just keep going, we try and make more, we try and make more money, or we create space and we create joy for ourselves and we care and we are part of you know, the work towards healing each other in our small community and then in our extended, but we can't do it until we heal ourselves. So right. this year has been the wake up, like the wow. And so now into the new beginnings, um, so much, so much has changed. Well, that, that's very interesting because uh, Deepak, I, I had a feeling you wanted to jump in when, what is, what is the, 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 the measure of success? What, what, what does that mean anyway today? What does it mean? And, and I think you, you really you know, hit the nail on the head there. Um, Deepak always speaks about, and I'm quoting you Deepak and you're here, but I have to quote you, but joy is the only measure of success is the ultimate measure. And I think that's something that we've been missing. And I probably misquoted you now, Deepak, so you can speak. <laughs> what you said is true. Joy should be the only measure of success, but it has components, okay? Joy has components. So I define success the way you defined it, but also as the progressive realization of worthy goals, number one. Number two, the ability to love and have compassion. And number three, to be connected to your source, yourself. If you have those three components, then you also have joy and it becomes the only measure of success. And we heard Mara actually go through this experience herself, you know, without anybody's aid or guidance. She discovered this on her own. And what do we have to thank? The pandemic. Yes. Yes. But it's, it's interesting. What I love about uh, Mara, your, your, your work, and, and, and at least the vision that I'm hearing from you, is that how do we really change the, the, the paradigm of, of all of these women working together, all in the, in the workplace? And I feel that that's so important as well to, 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 to realize that we do need to heal to be the best version of ourselves. Now, whatever that healing looks like, and as a woman, I mean, I'm sorry to put these numbers out there because they're very depressing, but one in three women today gets, um, has experienced some form of physical abuse, sexual harassment, et cetera. So th there is a place, we're born as women already into a place of non-safety and already into a, a space that has not, is not um, infused with support. Um, whether we're talking about a system, whether we're talking just about a street walk, or whether we're talking about 
a workplace because even our mental space that's something that's unpalpable um, is still not safe. So what we want to do and what we're aspiring to do um, is, is the, the, the awareness around women's empowerment and the mental space that connects us all. That's mental well-being that, that truly is the root of our joy, of our empowerment that ultimately filters out through these wonderful archetypes, but also the archetypes are the embodiment of our vulnerability and our strengths. And it's the perfect balance, what you were saying, Mara, it's this dance, it's the balance. How do we refine this balance so that we can truly express ourselves, truly be the best version of ourselves that supports everyone else around us? And, and that's, we're on this journey together. And, and this is a newly, a newly um, founded initiative. It started with um, mental health and suicide prevention on, 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 on a global conversation. And then we realized, uh, speaking with Renata Black of EBI, and, and we partnered with her to create a program specific for the women who were asking her, her company, they were like, we're, we have extreme anxiety. We, we're, we're, we're panicking, we don't know what to do. And so what we, we're, we're attempting to do, and, and when I say attempting, because it, it, there's a lot of work to do, we're all co-creators in this. We're all co-creating the tools together to, 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 to harness the journey together and enhance one another's journey as women to our empowerment, but to our mental well-being, and, and that takes a sangha, it takes a community, it takes a selfless service, it takes the love, you know, the love that comes from Siva, um, and it takes also um, the intention, the, the intention of, of wanting to pursue that, you know, and, 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 and that's really where we're coming from, I would say, the, the, the philosophy and the, the backbone uh, behind what we're doing, um, Never Alone, Love in Action at the Shoko Foundation. And so, so we're so glad to have women like you, Mara, just, just really being part of this conversation. Thank you. I, I want, I just, do we have a minute for me? To yes, ask? please. One, everything that you're saying, I think about this work, the work of women right now, and it's so easily thrown around, love yourself. Love yourself. You should, what do you mean? Like, and this idea, and then when you sip, why is it so hard? Well, why wouldn't that be just the easiest task, the most graceful thing for me to do, but it's not? And why? Why is it, why has it been so hard to like come to the core, you know, center of how you will actually be the greatest thing is to love yourself. And, and like you said, we come into this world and from, as women, and from the very beginning, we're almost taught the opposite. Mm. Through the messaging and what we receive and through our experiences, we are set up to do the opposite. Unless you have had some incredible experience of being sheltered and raised <laughs> by the most brilliant people mm. as a woman, as the more that you develop in, the more you are taught, oof, like that, I, how do I love myself in this? I'm not supposed to love myself. And then you hit that wall or that awakening where you realize I am of no service to others if I can't unlock this thing. How do I unlock mm. this thing? Mm. And so then you begin this act of like, it's like a child learning how to begin to love yourself in this true, meaningful, like whole way. And it's work. It isn't just this thing that's handed to you one day, like that you get to just, oh, now I do this and now I have this. And I think that people almost, women don't talk about that extra level of work and we're expected to go to a yoga class and love yourself. <laughs> oh, hold on. It's go to a yoga class, love yourself and then look good. And then look okay. good. And then look good. Conflicting ideas of all of this. And exactly. you with that. Yeah, you got that, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's just like, I, I'm completely with you. And it's taken, I'm 43 years old right now. And it's literally taken 40 something years to finally understand that it's, there's nothing wrong with like how I was built. Like this is how the system was set up. 
yes. system was set up to keep women really ultimately from their birthright, from their divine right of loving themselves. Because when they're loving themselves, this place is magnificent. It, yes. it, if women are truly individually in love with themselves, the way that they love outward, the way that this planet would look. So it's like that one key. How do we bring love to women? How do women love themselves? Because we're worried about this planet. We need women to love themselves. It's mm. so very good point. It's a very good point. And we actually developed a whole meditation on self-love. Mm. You know, we 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 put that into um, the program, the free program that we developed um, and, and partnered with Ebby for, and thus the Love in Action Awards. And, and so we've, we've concentrated um, uh, several aspects on self-love because that is the first thing. It's very hard to look in the mirror um, as a woman today uh, with all the advertisement, with all the burdens, the invisible burdens, with all the expectations to say, oh, I love this woman who's reflected in the mirror. Though Deepak would say, what is behind the reflection in the mirror and what is that mirror? You know, let's have a different, you see, that's a, it's a different, what is the state of awareness? And then all you see is just the beautiful reflection of ultimately who you truly are. And the who you truly are is the journey that every woman, but every human being should take. And it's the one of the most incredible journeys you could ever experience because it's life. And it's the embodiment of love in action or the embodiment of, of all of those principles. So every moment, whether it's a tragic tint or whether it's an empowering tint or whether it's a heroic moment or a flow moment is just so embodied that there's, there's nowhere else to be and there's no worry that interferes with your presence of being. So it, it's, it's, it's a... It's a powerful place to be at. And, and, and I think this is just the beginning for us um, at the foundation doing this work for, for really looking at the angle of that mental space for women empowerment and the healing, the healing, the love, the support system. Um, and I suppose I have one last question just because it will go in with our awards. Um, was there one woman during this whole pandemic that helped you just trigger you into, into the, the, the better version of yourself when you needed it the most? No, it was several women. Oh, well, there you go. I need to tell you that it was one woman, but multiple times through this past year, I would stop and I would even tell my husband, I don't even know where I would be without the conversations and the work that I'm able to do through my friendships and, and the women in my life because we hold this messiness of transformation so naturally. There's nothing polite about what's happened. It's like giving birth. It's not polite. It's not <laughs> And it tears you open and it like, and there's blood everywhere and it just rips you apart. It really does. And women have it built in like they are the mud and the lotus and all the parts and they the true ones that you can have that connection with can hold all of that messiness with you and so i don't even know where i would have fully put it without having that support system and you know, the women outside of my company and then the women inside of my company who are just brilliant leaders who were able, I, I almost saw it as this dance. It's like, we're all going, it's like a dance marathon. And then it's like, I'm exhausted. And the other ones sit down, we've got this. Oh, I love that. And, going, and it's like, tag me out for a few minutes. Okay, I've got, I'm ready to go back <laughs> in. Like, And it just felt, um, so it was many women. I love that, that's wonderful. Deepak, is there anything that, to, to close this lovely conversation, this lovely, inspiring, um, electrifying <laughs> experience. I'm calling this an experience. It's not a conversation. <laughs> I want to thank both of you, Mara and yourself, Gabriella. Uh, social scientists are today talking about something called emergence. Uh, emergence uh, requires the following uh, ingredients. Uh, 
emergence is some new creation that never existed before. So uh, what I've heard is it requires shared vision, complementing each other's strengths, and a spiritual and emotional bond in the team. So I heard that from Mara and from you. That's what's happening. We're seeing shared vision amongst the women leaders of the future. We're also seeing that they are complementing each other's strengths and they're deeply emotionally and spiritually bonded. You can't, there's no substitute for this. So God bless and onward. And I'll be a cheerleader. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. We'll connect. I'm coming back to New York. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll all have our, our physical tea together. I absolutely love that. And I just feel so grateful and so honored. I can't tell you what this conversation means to me. It's, oh. a, it's like a, a beautiful highlight in my year and in my life. So I deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mara, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting Love in Action. It means a lot to us so, because it's a larger conversation and it's a larger quest and it's, it's, it's a path. And, and we, we, we're all welcome on this path to just find solutions together. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Mara. Be safe. <laughs> thank you.